Romy, you're in a position of influence. Why don't more women of South Asian origin talk about the menopause? Um, I think the first que- the first thing is that people don't want to go to their GP. First, if especially to the male GP, they don't want to talk about it at all. I think we are in a generation that a lot of women want to talk about it, what's happening to them. When I was back in India, when my mom was going through, she didn't understand it. She mm. didn't know what was happening to her body. And they would say, oh, the change, or oh, the change, let's just uh, shove it under the carpet and not talk about it. But I think things are changing. I, I have two wonderful daughters for them really would like that what's happening to my body of course it's a change that is very important change at the same time i want them to talk about it want them to understand it and at the same time uh, my husband is very supportive he if i did not have a supportive under, husband who did not understand what mm. i'm going through i think men play such a huge part in the, the change the body the body's changing you know since when we you are 13 or 11 when the young girl is started the periods, I think the dad should actually go and start buying the pads or anything that a child needs. Mm. And that is where it starts. If it's starting from there, I think then the women will be more open, will be able to understand it, and then they will be able to talk about it. But at the same time, if you see there's radio, there's television, but we, if you ever see, there's no South Asian women has the opportunity to talk about menopause. Mm-hmm. Very rarely you will have someone, or even black community, very rarely. But I think it's so important, and every body is different. My body will be very different from somebody else's body. And think that kind of is so important to learn through that, because what I, you know, I, I when I was 40, it started happening. I didn't understand what was happening. I was emotional one day, I would eat so much, and then I would like, oh, why have I done that? And I, w- I would cry for no reason. I think then having the restaurant, running the restaurant, two little girls, I think there was so much going on in your life. When but was I, this? Um, 2013. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so I think I was crazy to open my restaurant when I was, 20, <laughs> <laughs> when I was 40. Yeah. Uh, I think there are so much of that. And then when you're going to a GP, you're making them understand. Sometimes they don't get it as well. You know, I'm not saying that all GPs are, they're wonderful GPs, but sometimes some don't understand you and some don't want to talk about mm. it. But I think for my body, I could understand why, what was happening. Like, you know, I ran so much. I ran practically six miles every day. But my body, the weight just went on. It was, my weight gain was so bad that I just couldn't, could not understand why I was gaining so much weight and I'm running six miles every day. So I think that when I met you, when I talked about it, then you told me about weight training. I think I learned so much from you and my pharmacist friend that this is happening to you. We are bo- you're, you're changing, your body's changing. I think if you can find somebody like that, mm. someone who can actually help you, guide you, talk to you and not be ashamed of it because I think the stigma behind it oh it's a shameful thing why should we be shameful it's your body it's human we're all humans that it's going to change I think that is very very important that if we start talking if I'm talking somebody else is talking then there will be women who will say oh actually this is happening if you I'm 51 if you see somebody other person who's 51 you will see how the age difference yeah it will look we are same and um, I think with our society also the way we eat we eat at very wrong time late at night we sleep with the carbs on then we are again we having so much sugar in the weekend with all the um, weddings and ritual celebrations i think there is so much that that you know we put on weight on our stomach weight goes on our back i think that for me was very understanding even i'm exercising my body is completely not loving the exercise and what i'm doing so the weight has really, really mentally, uh, physically has made me stronger. Now I'm less emotional as well. And I know what to eat, when to eat. Um, and I think that, and I have cheat days. I do eat everything. I would never, ever kind of stop eating. Yeah, I mean, of you're a food chef. by two, chef. Yeah, exactly. You love food. I love, I mean, yeah. I was asked a question recently, um, if there is food in front of you to cook or to eat, what would you do? I will be cooking and feeding people mm. and then eating it. I think that is the connection that I will always have. I always call myself a chef first and then everything else later. I think that understanding, and, and chefs have a tendency of not eating all day. Mm. we can easily do fasting yeah, and then yeah. uh, we eat the rubbish stuff at night and that is the wrong thing to do and especially with my body I think that was not working and also what's really really helped me I now three days 
religiously do 16 hours um fasting yeah it yeah. just works for me so so well mm -hmm. um and also first thing i get up now and drink is lemon i don't do vinegar because it's not good for my teeth mm -hmm. everybody should have their own ways i just mm. do lime hot water first thing in the morning and that is when i and i find that empty stomach um running or exercising is so much better for me than mm. having a full stomach and mm. doing it i think everybody is different absolutely so do it yeah. according to your way but i am so open to talk about it i write about me i'm in my next book i've written about menopause oh, because i was not getting an opportunity to talk about it or write about it oh no no somebody else else has written but somebody else who is a white person doesn't understand my body yeah. my um or somebody like you know, um, Andy Oliver's body. We yeah. have really different bodies. Yeah. We cannot be saying. Um, so I think that um, when you have a medium, you really need to speak about it. I think also daughters, I have two wonderful daughters. I really need to make sure they don't have the same issue what I went through. Um, and I want them to be, you know, vocal about it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You, the last time we, we spoke was a few, when we spoke in person, it was a few months back. Um, and I remember you telling me about your exercise regime. You were running a phenomenal amount. And I could sense the frustration yeah. because you were like, I'm doing all the right things. I'm following a lot of the guidelines, over exceeding the guidelines that the NHS gives me in terms of moving every single day, doing your aerobic exercise, et cetera, et cetera. But you were hitting brick walls all the time. And, then, and it, you were just telling me before we, we started here about your weight training, your deadlifting, your deadlifting, I think, more than me at the <laughs> moment, which is amazing. And the weight has sort of melted off you. I mean, you, you look yeah. fantastic. That's the first thing I, I said think, to you when you came this morning. I think also it's just made me, my legs were really strong with running. My upper body wasn't. Mm. Um, I could get really tired very quickly if mm. I was doing upper body training. But now my upper body is getting really better mm. um I, I like i can do planks and things like that before i can do five minutes planks now um five uh, minutes five minutes now wow so wow <laughs> um so you can plank longer than me you can deadlift more than me <laughs> <laughs> um I, I i'm really pushing myself i just think it's just that really help me mentally um, and I've given up on alcohol as well, like yeah. I said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm, we'll come back to alcohol one day because sure, I do yeah. like my red wine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I make my own wine. And, and your gin, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's just a, one of those things that I'm so determined. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying that I was size 8 or 10 when I was young and I want to be that. No, I don't want to be that. I want to be really fit that I can carry on doing the marathons and half marathons that I, I have done five half full marathons wow. and 40 half marathons I want to keep on doing that I think the the thing that really messed up was the r running didn't r really like my body wasn't liking running I think what I'm like I'm doing spinning now mm. I, I do walking running and then weights so I think that all that uh, is kind of working it's yeah. like a whole circle yeah that's working for me maybe it might not work for someone else yeah. but i just think also eating is really important what you eat what you put in your mouth I absolutely think. and it, you know you've been in the public eye for many years now you've done tv shows you're regular on daily shows you run your own restaurants or the rest of it i think it would be easy for an outsider to think romy just has this like abundance of energy you've always got a smile on your face i think you uh, can be perceived as someone uh, who fits that. But actually underneath it, particularly during the change, it, you were struggling quite a bit. How has your mental health shifted since doing all these different things? You should have asked my daughters and my husband <laughs> and some of my friends how horrible I was. I really? was really horrible. I would really get... If you're saying something even funny, I would just burst into tears and start screaming. I think I was really not a nice person, not in a nice place, but I didn't know what, what, what was happening. I think it was just that, and also the weight that when you put and you don't like when you yeah. have put on that weight, um, I think it just meant, mentally really, really puts you in a darker place. I think 2019 was the worst year for me. I think with many, many things, um, uh, closing the restaurant because my lease was up and then uh, my mom passed away I think that affected really badly and then my first book come out I had a major accident on, uh, on the motorway I think there were so many factors yeah. that uh, if you speak to my daughters and they, if they see me now and they when they see a few years ago I was not on, uh, in the right place because I didn't know they didn't know 
But I think if something now, if somebody's saying, I will just walk out of the room and just scream to myself and then come back and calm down. I think we are all humans. We have those things. But I think how you deal with it. Um, I think now my daughters are both in university. Um, that also affected because it does affect you because if your first child goes and you you know you you have a younger child mm. at home. But when Neve went recently, that was really emotional. I think that kind of. Um, you know, you start kind of what, what's happening. Um, yeah. But I think she's happy. She's really happy. My Both the daughters are very happy. I think my relationship with my husband is much better now. I think because uh, we can communicate better. Everything was about our daughters. Uh, we are both working. You know, he's a, he works and I did my restaurant and doing things on TV, writing books, going around the world to cook. But I think that now... Um, also women, Southeast Asian women, or any kind of women from any color, I think after your kids have gone to university, I think it's really important to have the relationship back, which you had maybe 20 years ago, 25, with your partner. Um, you need to go away. You need to have things you do. Yeah. My daughter has filled a jar before she went to university and written a note in like everything, go to walk together, go to a pub if you need, don't want to drink, go to see a film or a, or go on holidays and pick that out every week. So we kind of doing that, That's you know? Amazing. So that it's beautiful. It's such a th- thoughtful thing. And she's very thoughtful. I think um, we can easily give up on our relationships. You know, we all are humans, but I think how you can, uh, If it's, if it's breaking very badly, I think it's hard to join, but it, it's easier to kind of bring it together. I think that has helped. And having my HRT, like I'm started on my gel, which mm. is a gel just working and the marina coil. I think that also has helped me so much. Um, but that also has helped me with relationship with my husband as well. I think it, it's how... Like you said, where you are you ready to talk about it? I, I'm so ready to talk about it because I think it's so important that we can easily give on our relationship. Yeah. We can ev- easily have bad days with our kids. Yeah. Um, you know, my husband, when I when Neve was little, she was six months old. And when I was doing all these things, my husband was looking after the, you know, both the girls. I saw them for seven years. This is no joke. I saw them for one hour in the morning. That is it. So I think the relationship, I was also very angry that I don't have a relationship with my kids. Mm. They're very much daddy's girls. Um, they would go away with daddy and they wouldn't, you know, now my relationship with them is so much better yeah. that I could do those things and they're proud of what I do. But also they are the one who want me to talk about it. They are the one, mommy, you should talk about this. You should do this program. You shouldn't do this program. So I think that relationship also really helps. Yeah. We were talking at the start about how Asian women struggle to talk about menopause or even periods. You know, yeah. uh, I, I used to do a bit of work with um, Binti, um, the, the period charity yeah. that's focused on South Asian women, women from uh, South Asian descent. And um, I think with regards to women health in general, there is a lot of taboo yeah. and there is a, a there's a lack of, of voices. So I think partly one of the reasons why people struggle to find out good information about the menopause is for that reason. But also, I think we were chatting a little bit earlier about how you're struggling to find a voice on mainstream platforms when, you know, the South Asian story or the black story, for example, of women going through menopause is is missing. Mm -hmm. And I think we're having a moment right now where menopause is gaining a lot more traction, is getting a lot more attention as it should be. Mm -hmm. But the South Asian voice appears to be missing. And you were saying that you struggled, you know, to to find that sort of mainstream platform to, to talk about it. I have. I have tried many different channels. I've written like a proposal as well that we should kind of talk about it. Because where I live, it, it's a very, you know, different community to the communities where you would go. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of different, um, you know, if they're Punjabis, they're Bengalis, there are people from uh, Pakistan, in Indian Muslims. or You know, there are so many communities. We are not just one community. We all look different. We maybe speak the same language, like, you know, a little bit, but Indian Like Indian food, we are so regional. We are mm. so different people. So they have to understand that India is such a big country and we have communities here from different con- communities. So I think um, 
some communities might have partners who are very helpful and chat about it but then there are communities who wouldn't mm. and they will they will and you can't have tablets for it tablets sometimes don't work you need to understand that your body is going through something which is a, a part of us it's it's it should be proud of it we should mm. not be or what is happening it should be a part of it like it's your body changing women who can create babies women who can you know have periods it's all a part of a journey it's all a part of something that is i think it's 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 beautiful and then i think for me when i want to talk about it is no the menopause program has been done but come on it hasn't been done to the asian communities or the black communities where they might not have that kind of help yeah um the language barrier then there is so many uh, taboos about you know we cannot talk about it or this is not um th- this is not a, a problem it's not a problem it's a part of a body that's changing yeah. um so i think there are so many of those and then there are there's also poverty in some of the communities but also that they don't want to talk to go to a yeah. doctor and then talk about that i think you know being in in uk which is not a poor country and then having um going to some communities they're struggling like you said with pads sanity mm. pads i think that's appalling mm. that a rich country like us will be having that issues um but i think that is so important that which you said you did that work i think somebody round can help people that is so so important and going to schools as well you know younger when we when we talk about drugs in school so why drugs are bad for you this you know smoking or alcohol there should be classes for a levels or or people who are going to go to uni or whatever they should have those they should have that talk about it and with young men as well like mm. young boys because then they will understand then you will be able to give the support i don't get that we that we're not doing that in schools um but i think um like you said there is a lot of awareness but i think the awareness with the our communities are not not yeah. reaching yeah and that lived experience piece i think is really important yes. because i mean that's the reason why we're having a conversation today it's very easy for me to talk about the menopause and the different drugs that are available the exercises that we should be experimenting with the things that would help with weight gain or um some of the the um uh, mental health issues that accompany a uh, change in hormones um but without an appreciation for the lived experience of someone yeah. that encompasses the cultural taboos the the day to day the conversations that are not happening within families uh, or, or across communities um it, it it's kind of meaningless and i think that's why you as a woman of south asian origin um talking about it with your position is it's it's so important because it will enable a lot of other women to feel heard yeah. in this discussion it's also you have to understand it affects you mentally yeah. not just physically it affects you mentally then you go in your zone and you don't you're thinking everything is against you everyone is against you and you're doing things that's not working and also understand that not everybody can afford to go to a gym uh-huh. fine you can't afford to go to a gym there's a way on now social media you can do yoga at home. home um you can walk so there are certain things if we could explain it to people there are certain things that your body you can do it without going to um any of these yeah. you can do without paying so i think sometimes it comes the barrier comes with the money issues as well without not help any any and you know there are doctors like i have a friend who is a gp he would always say to me you will never come to women issues with me you are my friend <laughs> you should go to a women <laughs> yeah. doctor yeah, yeah, yeah. so i think that uh, we need to like <laughs> come, no uh, you know uh, dr johnson I, yeah. i would say don't call me dr johnson you're not coming to me yeah. um, but i think that is something different you can go it but i uh-huh. think if you have if you haven't got the help mm. um then it's really hard i think yeah 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 You mentioned food uh and obviously food is a huge part of your life um within Bengali community Punjabi as I am you know we we do have a sweet tooth yes. we do like our heavy base creams and and curries and stews and all that kind of stuff um what have you changed within your own diet and what kind of conversations are you having with other women and, and other families about how they can incorporate more nutritionally dense foods that could help with menopausal symptoms 
So I grew up in uh, my uh, in West Bengal. Somewhere I'm also like you, very Punjabi. Mm. Um, but I um, and my husband is is Punjabi. He's a very Punjabi. <laughs> he's a lot of. He's a vet. He's got very sweet tooth. Um, but the problem with him is skinny, tall, six foot four, skinny, and it's like, come on, where is that going? Um, I think what I have changed in my diet and also that we all eat now because the daughters have left home, that if I'm, I'm making something, he's got to eat that also. We're not going to have two different things. Um, but if I, in Bengal, a lot of people eat fish. Uh, so rice is the diet. Um, and Punjabis, we have a lot of lentil yeah. pulses, which is really good for you anyway. Yeah. Uh, and then the wheat based. So what I have changed in my diet, if I want a fish, I other day did a mustard fish, like a blended into mustard seeds yeah. and lemon juice and salt and pepper. But I uh, had a drizzle of oil and cooked it in the oven okay. rather than pan frying it. Right. Okay. So uh-huh. I, um, st- it's, or you could steam it as well. Uh-huh. Um, then you don't need any oil. Yeah. Uh, so I, um, in a, a parcel, like I don't have banana leaves at home. So I just a baking sheet, wrapped it around and it cooked like within 10 minutes is what's mm. done. And also don't overcook your fish. You, you have to have eight to 10 minutes of this, uh, you know, 180 <laughs> degrees. Yeah. You know, you can't, if you, the moment you're cooking, the white stuff is coming. It's just, just have to have that kind of thing so what I've changed is also like if I'm doing any kind of dal um, and, and sometimes I see on social media dal that drives me crazy because our dal like Punjabis yeah. we have the tarka on the side which yeah. is the tempering and then our dal we cook but just I think he if you use very little of it it's very good for you because it's a good fat So years ago, I did not understand that, that the fat which can be bad, the oils which can be bad. So I think reading books, understanding during my menopause, uh, ghee is a good fat. Mm. So if you're using a teaspoon or a tablespoon, whatever, and making a little tarka, you're actually making for six portions or five. Yeah. You're not using too much. Yeah, yeah, 100%. You need yeah. that good fat in you. The amount of exercise I do, I need that good fat <laughs> in me. So I think that I have been starting to learn and how to moisturize the onions. Like, you know, remember when I said uh, it drives me crazy when people don't cook the onions and don't give love to the onions. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's the way to, Just of, to clarify that, because you, you, you want, you know, a good 15, 20 minutes on your onions before you start adding. Uh, that's a t- the best tip for people don't even need 15 minutes is onions cook on high heat. Okay. So if you're cooking onions on high heat, whether you're using oil, butter, ghee, whatever, uh-huh. any kind of oil you're using, make sure your pan is very hot. Uh-huh. You add the oil or ghee, it expands. So uh-huh. using less first is that. And then uh-huh. second, when you when the pan is hot, the oil is hot, you add the really diced small onions mm-hmm. in it, cook in high heat. So uh-huh. what happens if the onion does not absorb the oil? So the moment you're cooking on low heat, the onions will absorb the oil. You mm-hmm. will need water, oil, more to More, more, more. yeah. So the high heat continuous, till 15, five to six minutes, oh. the onions will caramelize. Okay. And then you add whatever ginger, garlic, tomatoes you want to add. Oh. So tomatoes are always really good if you're using fresh or tinned. It, that kind of brings the water for you. So okay. you don't need to add more water. You don't water. need to add more, So yeah. within 10 minutes, your paste is done. Oh God, I have so many things I've learned recently <laughs> yeah. that you can do. And my dad's a very, very cook, good okay. cook. So yeah, yeah. Um, he's he teaches me so many things. Yeah. And he's like, why are you adding more oil? Why aren't you doing this? So I think those things have made me so much aware. And then again, like vegetables, if I'm making aloo gobi, mm. I will not do it in a pan now. So I will have my onion, ginger, garlic, whatever mm-hmm. I'm using, and then florist of cauliflower with potatoes, sprinkle with spices I'm going to use, and then chilies or whatever, and then uh, tomatoes in it, little bit of drizzle of oil mm-hmm. in the oven, I make my aloo gobi. Oh, so you bake it? Bake it. Oh, okay. So I'm trying to do all those things, yeah, yeah. but also if you're going to do it in a pan, and that also, you're not looking at it, you don't have to waste time, yeah, you can do something yeah, yeah. else. But uh, if I'm doing a pan, I will make sure how am I doing it, you know that I'm not using a lot of oil but I just kind of understand like reading different books which oils are good which fats are good for you and you need that yeah but at the same time um instead of adding cream I would add nuts right okay yeah. so I would add nuts to make it creamy yeah. um like you know um uh, if I want a creamy kind of chicken I will add nuts to it yeah. different kind of nuts what kind of nuts do you so I'll use I know cashew is quite high so if I have cashew almonds even uh, hazelnuts what I do is blanch them mm-hmm. so you take yeah. the skin off 
then you grind it and then you blend it and you use it almonds any kind of nuts you like pistachios mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it depends on which dish will go with that yeah. you can't just have any, any nuts in your dishes yeah, yeah, yeah. um so i learned that that you can make it more creamy without adding all that but then nowadays you know coconut milk light coconut but i just tell people that if you can buy fresh one the easy tip is like in india the women would grate it yeah and you can make your own coconut milk it's oh, much, so much better so i, know. Much I better. wish i lived near a place that had fresh coconut I know. Uh, just like grating it you get that contraption don't you that you yeah. put on the side of your yeah. kitchen and you just you, you, you can do that you can just if you have time you can grate it and then you can do loads of different things which yeah. i've i have in my next book yeah, yeah. So, yeah <laughs> the tips and things like that yeah. I've, i have said to people like you can do these way yeah um and and i think awareness is like I, i'm learning I'm, i'm i don't know anything a to z yeah, about yeah. india that's why I'm, i write books is all about travel cookbooks yeah. and and it i learn so much from different people how you the techniques and yeah. methods i think it's important that we should eat everything but yeah. just like not fattening things every single day yeah yeah absolutely and i think there's a time and place where yes. we can have the full like full fat or whatever it yeah. might be and i think what you're articulating there is like uh, a very big difference to how we all can consume to optimize our, yeah. our well-being because you know for certain people at different stages of their life or going through the menopause they might benefit from a very low carbohydrate diet for mm. example you know and they might have Uh, astonishing results they they lose weight they feel better in themselves they're less bloated less bloated their numbers improve yeah. their cholesterol ratios improve all those different things you give the same high fat high protein diet to uh, a man or a woman from from south asian origin could have the complete opposite effect yeah. and i i've seen patients and 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 even you know close friends of mine go on these low um carbohydrate diets and the cholesterol ratios just go mm. like through through the roof and it's because we utilize and partition fuel and fats differently exactly. all of us so you know what might sound a bit too starchy or too carb heavy with lentils and sweet potato and all the rest of it actually may be beneficial for a lot of people and being mindful of the fats as well and i agree with you about you know ghee uh, or olive oil or even like little bits of butter as well as long as you're using the appropriate amounts mm. and you're spread like you said you're spreading it across like four servings then that that is a great way of using what is a very important nutrient to absorb all the other vitamins that we have and things like dark green leafy mm. vegetables that require fat for absorption also like millets are very important like yeah. ancient millets in india traveling which i've learned is so good for you yeah. and and if you want to have you know carbs like that have millets millets mm. are the most amazing uh, you can make so many different flatbreads with it mm. but also like you know what do you put it is a butter but butter ja, bajra jawar bajra, that's it yeah um so you can eat those and uh, makki you know yeah. like corn corn yeah. um so My different ha- ragi which is again a different kind of um, uh, uh, flower mm. uh, which you get in the mountains and i've been here but you can find in this country now to, as well i think also in the uk we should go back to our, how it started go back to the millets millet millets need less water to grow as well it's very good for the environment i think also i'm thoughtful of what i'm eating i'm not just for my body but also yeah. important what i'm kind of um le- you know you need a legacy for your whoever is going to follow you it's really important to kind of do that and my love um, i i really have fallen in love with bajra and jawar because i just think you need also need to know how to make those you yeah, know it's yeah. just the, the tip and trick because yeah. i couldn't make them and i used to get angry with them but now i just learned how to make them it's so yeah. easier so quick and so good for you yeah yeah uh, you we were talking about lentils yeah. and uh, so the the way you make lentils i'm assuming is you you, you make them plain and then you add the tadka afterwards How, are there other ways that other people in different parts of of India Bengal or yeah. whereabouts that would would make So uh, there are uh, so dal when people like when I did my first book there's a dal recipe which is very bengali kind of mm. stuff They've, it's a very broth it's very runny because okay. some parts of in bengal they will have a like water liquid dal yes as well. yeah yeah so people need to understand dals cannot be stodgy all the time cannot be thick cannot be There are a hundred ways of making lentils, yeah. okay? There's so many different lentils as well. So some take longer, some take less time. But you have to, like, um, you know, in Bengal, like my friend's mom would make the dal with turmeric and salt, and then she would put mustard seeds and uh, uh, green chilies or things later on. Okay. You know, just like uh, on the top, just before serving. Or 
my another friend of my 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 mom's she would cook ginger garlic everything in or curry leaves she would add and then cook the lentils and the other ingredients together so that is easier it's like a one pot wonder yeah so yeah. you're not wasting too many pots either either yeah. so i think there are so many ways I, i i just what really annoys me is that people making coconut dal all, all the time but please learn how to make it <laughs> because <laughs> there's a way of making it you know um but then it ta- then you taste it and then you taste somebody you will understand what i'm talking about mm. i think it's the cheapest so everybody has red lentils at home it's the cheap good healthy diet that you can use and if you're a meat eater i've learned from chef um gil miller who's a wonderful chef yeah. um he taught me once he came to my restaurant as a guest chef that if you put red lentils and you want to slow cook your um lamb mm. um, whatever leg of a lamb you're cooking with onion ginger garlic whatever you want to put and put the lentil in, it gives you the most creamiest yeah. wonderful meal mm. that it is so delicious yeah. so there's so many way, ways of making it then you can make pancakes with it you soak it and blend into um with some spices and then you can make a pancake yeah. chila we call it in some some parts what's it called chila chila and chila. As in like and in gujaratis they call it chila okay. so um and then um you can just use make the pancakes savory pancakes mm. this is in jaika you should make it yeah which is made in uh, with um uh, gram flour okay which is uh pakora flour yeah, yeah. so uh, it's really good for you anyway yeah. because you know the People need to understand that a chickpea fla- that is not chickpea. Uh-huh. When people say garam flour and chickpea flour is same, it's not. Uh-huh. So the the garam flour is made of black chickpeas. Okay. So the black gram is roasted and mm-hmm. then it's made into that. So mm-hmm. It's not made from white chickpea. Okay. White chickpea flour is very different. Okay. Okay. So the ones we use in our house is from the black chickpeas. Uh huh. Uh huh. They're roasted and then. What's um, the different name of it? So you have garam flour and you have. The chickpea flour, like normal people use, just, you know, it's just called chickpea flour. Yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. So don't, you know, the garam flour is is not is roasted black chickpeas. Gotcha. It's a black garam. It's right. like that, you know, that that kind of lentils that they use to make the flour. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There are a lot of patterns of Indian food that actually are very healthy. They're steeped in tradition and Ayurveda and everything, but the reputation of Indian food is. stodgy very high fat not good for you basically that's the that's the sort of like impression that most people in the uk and the us would have of indian food what are the sort of um facets of 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 our rich sort of diverse diet have you utilized in in your cooking that has helped potentially with your your menopause or something um else? i think because this is really useful i think for women of south asian origin who are just constantly told Uh, have your kale have your sort of like beans all that stuff you know actually we need to make it relevant for for people of different backgrounds so the the spinach is very good for you any whether you're pregnant whether mm. you're going to what various things you know there's so many different ways of making it you just don't have to have a palak paneer yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or as which english people call it sagalu saga, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you can actually just use it in the lentils mm. you can use it in the meat uh, you can use it in various ways of doing it so i think when for most of my cooking now involves a lot of um ovens now i do a lot okay. of in the oven or one pot wonders i try to do because then you're using a lot utilizing a lot of your things and also i would say to people mm. just get a, a box vegetable box delivered which is much much more or if you're living near south asian um shops yeah. just get those boxes and there's so many different kind of uh, vegetables there so use those vegetables in not just frying way You know that okra can be cooked in so many different, which is very good for you. Again, mm. it's it's got that starch, it's got that sliminess, which is good for you. And so some people don't don't like it because the way it's cooked. But you can cook it really crispy without yeah. deep frying it. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um. So I haven't used one of those things which are going um air fryers. I don't. You use haven't it. used it. I haven't haven't got. So one. look, look. I'm going to tell you. I was so snobbish about the air fryer. Yeah, I am my, very snobbish. Yeah, about it. and my <laughs> mum got onto it about a year and a half. Ago. No, probably two years ago, and I just thought my mum's um. She's got all the gadgets you can imagine, like a dehydrator, yeah. the magic mixes, like all that kind of stuff. And I just thought this is just another one of those gadgets that's going to end up in the garage unused, gathering dust. But the air fryer is pretty phenomenal. I I, I have to give it to to her. Um, it dries out the food quite a bit, mm-hmm. but it gives a crispiness with very very little fat required that I 
I can't replicate in an oven unless I'm using something like a rationale, you know, like in a commercial kitchen. I don't think this is a commercial gadget. I don't think there's any requirement for a restaurant to have it. But at home, it's pretty phenomenal. I've been using it quite a bit. Give me your go. Give, give, give me the, the, the straw I man still... argument. <laughs> Tell me what you don't like about it. I don't know. I think it's laziness. <laughs> Lazy. <laughs> you, can, you can make a really crispy potato in oven, I think. Or, or but it's cheaper. It's cheaper. It, it is cheaper. True. I think yeah. that's one of the reasons why, particularly over the last like couple of years, it's become pretty fashionable in houses yeah. because you don't need to preheat the oven. You can just whack it straight in. I'm, I'm so, I, I sound like I've got an air fryer book. I don't. I haven't got any air fryer <laughs> book recipes coming out at all. But I, I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty bullish on it. I will, uh, you know, it's like you and me. We get sent things, but I refuse it. Maybe I should go back and tell you them should. to give me one. You should, honestly. <laughs> you know? I just try it. A uh, couple. I'd be really interested in your thoughts on the the texture and you know the differences. I I put um the 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 two big things for me i i found a, a mushroom so just the ripped oyster mushrooms put it in there with a little bit of olive oil and salt um aubergine that's kind of what got me thinking about it so just chopping it up and then putting it in there for again like maybe 10 minutes mm -hmm. and the oven to get the same sort of uh texture i'd need at least 15 or 20 um and uh Oh, it just, yeah, like uh, starches, like uh, potatoes, um, new potatoes, I find, like give a really good wedge. So it's a good thing for students to have. Definitely. 100%. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe I should go back and see. I don't know. I, I love <laughs> cooking. I love experimenting different ways yeah, yeah, yeah. rather than just putting them in there. Maybe I should. I don't the, know. I, I use it as an addition to everything yeah, else. Yeah, so yeah. like, you know, I might uh, put some white beans in it yeah. and then just get that crispiness and that will go on top of like my salad or whether I've made a curry or whatever it might be. It just gives a different element that I don't need to rely on my oven for. Anyway, that's my... There's my little championing I of an air I do fryer. like slow cookers. Oh, okay. Okay, do so you like do. Some. All right, so you do like some, some... Some slow cookers. When I don't use it anymore. When the girls were very little, so uh -huh. I would kind of put things in it, meat and, and, and whatever I'm using, beans, and let it cook while yeah. I'm doing something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, But I haven't used for years. But I do like it. Oh, dal. It makes a good dal. Slow mm. cooker makes a good dal. So mm. you can add everything in it and it makes really, really good. Even if a kitchery, if you want to make a kitchery, which okay. is lentil and rice and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, spices and ginger garlic. So you can do that as well. But um, air fryer, I haven't. So I'm not being snobbish. I just find that I have so much time that I can actually want to create yeah. a yeah, recipe yeah. and then write about the recipe and then people can have that. Not yeah. everybody would like an air fryer. Yeah. I think there are people who are writing books on it and they're brilliant books, you know. Um, um, what's the name? Poppy. She's yeah, written an air yeah, yeah, book. Yeah. I think she's brilliant. She does a, you know, she's very good at what she does. Um, she's fantastic. I think for me, I have to be different. I cannot be running around uh, as what other people are doing. And I have <laughs> yeah. to follow. Um, uh, you know, I don't want to. I want to be the crowd that follows everyone. So yeah, I want to yeah. be, uh, be me. Yeah, so yeah. I if it's be, not you, it's yeah. not you. Yeah, so yeah. it's not me. I'm not nothing against it. Yeah. But I just think I, I had a very good company sending me, which is quite expensive, and I yeah. said no. Yeah. Because I just think that I'm not going to be. I'm, I'll, I'll become more lazy then. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. It came out of necessity for me whilst yeah. we had the kitchen being built. <laughs> I didn't have a kitchen, and all I had were these two air fryers that were sent to me. And that's when I became like a bit of an air fryer zealot. But anyway, and in terms of like um, swap, so, you, you know, you're probably using a little bit less meat, mm -hmm. you're adding lentils, you, you may have made some sorts. Are there any sort of spices or herbs that you've come across that, you know, you, you start using more of? So I think the Indian food generally, um, as the spices, we are so rich in spices. Yeah. Each spice does so different things to your body mm. and con combining it will do something very different. You know, like people were talking about these um, flax seeds, which we use in India all the time. All the time. We make pildeladu, laddu, you yeah, know, yeah. things like that yeah. and flax seed laddu, which mm. we, my parents have been like, my grandma's been doing, all the women, not just my parents, yeah. been doing for years and years and they give you, and also people don't understand, flax seeds should only be eaten in winter. Right. Oh, okay. It, the heat. Okay. So the heat, um, you know in the uk we, we might be okay but when you live in a country that has seasons mm. it's hot well you know monsoon um, and then cold so in parts where it's very very cold they will only eat then 
Okay. They will not eat any other time yeah, because it yeah. brings out the heat. Okay. So I think that a lot of like sund, which is like made with ginger powder, which Punjabis very much eat, which mm. is which helps you with your cold. Yeah. Um, it's like a broth. So they will only have it when it's cold. They will never have it like hot, hot, hot uh, time. And then like mangoes in India, which uh, raw mangoes, they'll um. I burn it on the um, on open fire and then peel the skin off and they make this um, really good drink which is which has black salt in it and then uh, jeera crush the jeera and put that in with salt and sugar so we drink that because that helps you with the loo which is the mm, heat mm. wave when you have there are re- there are things that india is very rich and very diverse and now uh, some chef learns it and say oh i've created this <laughs> it's actually been going on in the generations um in india but i think you have to i have i have to go back to my roots and learn all these yeah. things because sometimes you forget that but then each like fennel a um your mom would say like um, black cardamom yeah. cinnamon or cloves when you have a baby when you're breastfeeding it they will have this drink they yeah. boil it and they will tell you to drink so that it's when you're weaning the baby or have breastfeeding it's very good for the, your stomach and the baby's because babies you're breastfeeding them it's good for your baby mm. um so all those things are natural mm. so there are no additives in it we are naturally so it, we also are very naturally plant based country yeah so the whole point of my me writing the first book is that we are naturally very very uh, vegetarians um and we eat without thinking we mm. eat plant based food mm. okay so that was a point of writing the first book and then the, the spa, like ajwain which is like a bishop's wheat not caraway seeds people think it's a caraway seed so the bishop's wheat is ajwain um and then um fennel are the most best digestive things you can have mm. for your body mm. i think it's just going back to your roots and turmeric has been like people are selling golden milk <laughs> <laughs> golden latte which you know i i still dislike it but um, my parents would give it to us to drink it i used to hate it my mom used to give it to me when i was um, revising i know i, I remember With it just tasted all almonds in it yes <laughs> like, yeah it's very punjabi thing yeah good dad, for your brains yeah my dad would give me um what's this badan mix uh, yeah. almonds basically just crushed Brush with it. a bit of sugar and yeah. that would feed that every time when I have my exams as well. It's good for your exams, it's yeah. good for your body. Yeah, um, yeah. I think those are the things that people should go back to their roots, learn about the spices, learn about all those things. And also like, you know, um when you are eating, what time is good for you, what is not good for you. Eating at 10 o'clock with full carbs and then sleeping is definitely not yeah. good for you. Yeah, yeah. So what has really affected me then with my menopause is a lot of people have sweats and things like that what's affected me badly is my sleep mm. my sleep is the worst yeah. um i have to now leave my phone away not look at people what other people are doing i think that also was really anxiety what other others are doing yeah. um i just don't look at it enough let them do what they're doing i rather read a book now or just um you know do my work and and go to sleep but i think sleep sleep has been the worst that's affected me yeah and in terms of the fasting protocol you mentioned 16a yeah. is that how long have you been doing that for because that that sounds like it was relatively four months new. now four months four and months it, and what was your initial reaction to it did did it seem very easy was it a struggle um first few days i think first and the third day is a struggle uh-huh. um second day something i don't know what your body is adapting and third day again your body's thinking what's happening <laughs> um but just don't give up and i i did not uh-huh. you know i would drink lots of green teas and water and anything like that but uh, or black coffee yeah. uh, but i just you just have to mentally be prepared mm. if you're not mentally prepared you can give up easily in 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 few days or within a week i think if you're mentally set mentally prepared what you want to do what you want i think that then really helps and also i think you really need forget about your partner your daughter or anyone your or your children you need a friend that will you can talk to your friend yeah. rant went whatever you can you need that kind of friend really really important yeah. and i have a friend she's a, <laughs> adele i she's a pharmacist i can she knows more about menopause than my gp knew okay and he he's lovely i yeah. love him to bits he's yeah. a great gp yeah. he's very helpful very thoughtful but she knew more uh-huh. because she's all the time yeah. with the medicine people shouting at her 
I know we need the medicine now, we need it yeah, now. You know yeah. the things she goes through, yeah. and she needs somebody to talk to. I think we have such a good relationship that when I'm very hyper and really, you know, something's happened, she calms me down, mm. and she's a very calm person. So I think you need a friend that will listen to you yeah. when they just listen to you, yeah. not interrupt you. I think she has really, really helped me than awesome. anything else. I think, yeah, you know, yeah. that kind of friendship is very hard to find. And if you can sustain that kind of friendship, it's really important. Even Absolutely. find a neighbor who can listen to you. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone, we yeah. find it. I think it's so important. And the women are sometimes just go into that shell yeah. and they don't want to talk about it. And then they burst open, yeah. which I used to do. I think Adele and there's another lady who helps me with my charity events is um, Ruth. So those two women, uh, even if we don't see each other, they're always there for me. Mm. I think that kind of friendship is very hard to find. And I I guess with fasting protocols, everyone has their um, regimen that will work for them. And it's not strictly fasting. It's just time-restricted feeding. You know, you're restricting yourself. You're not restricting yourself. I won't eat anything after eight either. After eight. And have you found that helps your oh, sleep? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It has. And sometimes my, if I have been working and I um, don't eat all day and then I've eaten really late because my body needs food, mm. um, and then it might be half nine, and then I can see my sleep pattern just goes. Yeah. Like last night, I just had come back from um, cooking from Yorkshire yeah. two days in Lancashire. And I couldn't sleep because I ate it very late. I came home, I was starving and I ate it and I could not sleep. Yeah. So I think I then had to go in a different room and sleep so I don't disturb my husband. So I think that um, I find that if I eat late, my sleeping pattern is very bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've definitely found eating earlier for me and definitely for a lot of patients has helped um, as well as staying off social media. You, you, you mentioned learning a lot more about our spices, our history, you know, the origins of recipes, food. Where do you get your information from? I think this is a very common question I get. Like, where do, where do you learn this from? Where, how do you know about the difference between ground flour, chickpea flour? How do you know? It, it seems very intuitive to us, perhaps because, you know, we've just picked up things in the way. But if you're yeah. starting fresh, and maybe you might even be from Asian uh, uh, descent, you might even have Asian parents, but you didn't really pick these kind of things up. Where do you start? So I think, first of all, like you are first gen or second generation. Second, gen, second generation. Yeah. My daughter's a first generation. Okay, They're born here like you. So I think there are lots of food writers. Chefs are born in this country uh, from Indian origin. They write about things and they write where they're from that community. Let's say I pick you. I don't want to name anybody. I pick you. So Ruby's from Punjabi community, uh, born second generation, um, and he's born, he's from an Indian family, very Punjabi. You will know what your mom cooks, right? Mm. Or your aunties cook, your mm. friends cook. So you'll, and also you're very sheltered in that Punjabi community. You're going to your Gurdwara, whatever, I mean, just an example, yeah. okay? And then comes other communities that are happening. But uh, you will not know No, I'm not saying that you're not you're not willing to want mm. to know, but you will not know the knowledge that maybe I had, uh, in a sense that I w- I, w- I grew up to a Punjabi family, but I grew up in West Bengal. Mm. So my parents moved from Punjab like migrants, and my dad worked in a steel plant like my dad. So many people came from all over India, not just one. Yeah. So I w- I w- the community that I w- I was very sheltered in a sense that people came from Gujarat, Rajasthan, Kashmir, or South different South in- states, and then even from Manipal, Mizoram, and you know Nepal, people came to work there. Mm. So when you have that kind of knowledge, and when any kind of we didn't have social media, there was one phone in that community that yeah. people would go and phone. Um, so I think when there is a celebration, a birthday or a ritual or pujas happening, which Bengalis have a celebration, that that then you kind of my, my mom would make something Punjabi, somebody would Bengali would make fish curry or something like that. They would all bring it together. Yeah. I think that flavors that kind of taught me so much more than I would have ever learned from anywhere or reading or going online. But at the same time, my mom had cancer when I was doing my A-levels. So her, the person who knew how to cook so much, she was, she was so good at cooking, she would put so much salt, she would like Her tasting notes were different. Yeah. Uh, and I think that really also made me more aware of understanding about the food and where it comes from, what it's happening, what you're doing to your body. I think those kind of collaborated together. And when I moved here, 
and it just I wanted to be always wanted to be a chef and my dad wouldn't wouldn't want me to be he said no you won't survive and mm. it's very male dominating you wouldn't and it is true it's still there but I think um, if you have in you and I think the support of my husband really helped me with that and then when I opened the restaurant then I was learning more and now with my books I go to those parts yeah. I, I go and do so much research yeah. before I can even of course I can go online and find that, but no, that you have to go and meet those people. You have to sit with them, and then you have to become like them. Because if you're with them, they will tell you everything about them. Mm. And then you, you you're eating with them, you're cooking with them. Then you know how they're cooking, how they are putting those spices. I think that is very very important. I I'm not saying that everybody who can't afford to even living in the UK go to different parts like yeah. Lancaster. You know, I was I was told they have three wonderful cheeses. Yeah. You know, going to different like Scotland or Wales, any part we will all have different things, yeah. which are very important for a for for everybody who lives in that state. I think that is what India is so fascinating in a sense that you know we were ruled by different people by the Mughals and then we we were a very rich country and we have all these different kind of stories you know um then if you want to follow those parts and go and listen how the trade route the silk route how the people came and you know how um the Alexander the Great is, like Tamor they tried to come into India and with that the for me i was very fascinated with the kashmir was with them they brought their own army of first uh, craftsmen mm. cooks which are called the vazas and all that kind of thing which is still there and then you go to south and there is a place in andaman nikobar island that a lot of people don't know when i went to write for a suitcase magazine there is a tribal which is descendants of africans uh-huh. so i i think you couldn't go near them before yeah, we were not yeah. allowed to go there yeah, yeah, because yeah. they would you know um, um, harm you exactly, but now yeah. it's kind of different but then we and have now you so can go and visit them. yeah you can oh really oh wow um but yeah it, there's still warnings that you should have you have yeah, to be very like, careful yeah, and all yeah. that kind of stuff but i just think that we we have so much tribe tribes in india that no one talks about the tribes we yeah, have the yeah. tribes food is very different you know there are tribes in india and orissa they eat this ants which are the red ants mm. you know make the chutney out of it so there is so much wow. to learn there is so much power in india yeah. that we just um make i mean i love butter chicken we're standing there making just butter chicken there is more to india than taj mahal yeah, there's yeah. more to india than that you know butter chicken there's so much more that yeah. you should go not to that triangle if you want to learn india and indian history you need to kind of travel so the in in where i'm born there's armenian culture there's uh, obviously um East India Company was the capital at that time, British. Um, then there is a lot of Mughla, Mughals, you know, there are just so many, Guj- mm. there is um, Marwari, Punjabis are there. So many influences of so many different cultures are, and Jewish community, there's so many different. So you have to understand with that comes the wealth, comes the knowledge with, yeah. I think when you travel, whether you're immigrant or a migrant, with travel comes the language, the food, the culture and then you kind of share that with other people that's how the knowledge kind of expands I yeah think. yeah yeah honestly you the breadth of knowledge you have of food is wonderful. I'm still learning I know you're still learning <laughs> but that you're humble enough to to realize that you're still learning even though you you know a lot more than most people particularly those who are sort of like teaching others um, and myself included you know I, I feel like I can learn so much from you and I have done already so I appreciate that and I appreciate your you know vulnerability in in sharing your story and the passion you have for for women's health and more generally as well as you know specifically for our community mm-hmm. so I really appreciate that Romy you're oh, you're thank wonderful thank you thank you for having me and I'm glad you can notice the change in me <laughs> yeah, absolutely <laughs> my husband might ask him ask him Um, yeah, <laughs> he doesn't want to say anything <laughs> in case I jump onto him and say <laughs> something. He is always so placid. Um, when somebody else sees me after a long time and yeah. they say, you have, you can see the notice, the difference. Yeah, Because absolutely. then it, I think that motivates you more. Totally. If you're not losing weight and mm. you're losing weight in different ways, I think that really, uh, I was six, I have to tell, I was size large 16 uh-huh. which probably going to 18 uh-huh. so this i'm wearing is size 12 yeah yeah so that's dropped and it's not tight 12 so yeah. it's dropped so many sizes and, and i remember you saying actually that you wanted to be an inspiration for your daughters yeah. as well you wanted to showcase that look look at me 
at my age, I can still look after my body. I can still look after my health. And you're not just being an inspiration for them. You're being an inspiration for women across, you know, anyone who's listening to this, watching to this, uh, as well as uh, across all the channels that you're uh, you're broadcasting on. So I really appreciate you. Thank you. <laughs> if you like that video, then you will love the full library from the Doctor's Kitchen podcast. We talk about inflammation, immune health benefits, and much, much more about food as medicine, including this video right here that you can click through right now.